<clears throat> Ooh. That's too big. Let's hope that no tech issues happen today. No interruptions. Zero interruptions. Oh. Hope everyone's doing well today. Hope the fast is still going strong. Hope we have a blessed Lent. Those are my Catholic homies. Ooh. And with that, let's get into it. What? Setup is loading. Why? Why, why? The installation file, or is there an update? There we go. I guess it was an installation file. Do, 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 do. Let's see here. Okay. And if I do this, doop. Uh, my notebook. Does it look good on the preview? Yeah, it does. Okay. I think we're just going to restart chapter five since I was having all the kinds of tech issues yesterday. We we're only like 15 minutes in, I think, to the stream. Let me charge, put my phone on the charger here. It's been a hard beginning of the week, guys. Man. What a night. What a day. <clears throat> The encounter with, so this is chapter 5, The Messenger of God. The encounter with the story of Muhammad's life, like the encounter with the Quran, requires a shift in perspective, both on the part of the Christian and of the secularist, as also on part of all those, including contemporary Muslims, whose minds have been shaped by a modern education. The Christian, if he wishes to understand Islam, must resist the temptation to compare Muhammad with Jesus. For these two had entirely different roles in the scheme of things, and the secularist is invited to taste, if only as a hypothesis, the flavor of the sacred and of a human life totally determined by a divine intention. The contemporary mind seeks, seeks for causes to explain phenomena, and, leave, and having discovered how this or that came to exist, forgets to ask why it came to exist. For the traditional Muslim, on the other hand, a person, a thing, or an event, is what it is because God has looked upon this possibility hidden in his treasury, as yet unmanifested, unexpressed, and, as, and has thereby brought it out into the light of existence. His command when he intendeth the thing to come into being is only that he saith unto, unto it, Be, and it is. What we see as a casual co a sequence of events is then seen as a pattern already complete in the mind of God. Causal factors can be discovered for every event, since they exist in the network of relationships which make up the total pattern, and the human mind functions in the context of causality, like a blind man feeling his way from one object to the next, but they do not explain why such an event was necessary. Modern biographers of Muhammad say, in effect, that because such and such chance events came his way, therefore he was the man he was, acted as he did, and said what he said. 
This approach makes no sense to the traditional Muslim for whom this man was what he had to be, did what he had to do, and said what he had to say in accordance with the divine intention. We have not created heaven and earth and all that it is, is between them and all that is between them without meaning and purpose, as is the surmise of those who are bent on denying the truth. Orientalists in particular, von, von Grunenbaum, speak of Muhammad's luck as though the world were so lacking in direction and so empty <clears throat> that a religion must depend upon luck to establish itself, or as though, having decided to transform a great part of humanity by means of a divine revelation, God turned his back and left the whole matter to blind chance. It follows that, from the Muslim point of view, the world into which Muhammad was born, Arabia, in the 7th century of the Christian era, was a world providentially designed to receive him and to give both the message of the Quran and the message contained in the story of his life the precise shape and coloring they have. The gemstone was matched to its setting, as was the setting to the gem, and to suppose that either could have been other than they were is to introduce a concept of chance which has no place in this context. It's kind of like a secular point of view, right? Arabia in that period was divided into three zones. The north lived under the shadow of two great empires, Christian Byzantium, known as the Arabs as Rome, which, I mean, is accurate. It was Rome, um, you know, by all stretches of the imagination, it was the continuation of the Roman Empire, and Zoroastrian Persia, empires in perpetual conflict and so evenly matched that neither could achieve definitive victory over the other. These great powers occupied the stage, while in the shadows and the wings... The Arabs on the northern region of the northern region allied themselves now with one, now with the other, according to where their advantage lay. In the south lived the people of Ma'in, Saba, Kataban, and Haudramaut. <clears throat> no stranger to history, for this was for this was the land of frankincense and myrrh, and all the perfumes of Arabia, the happy land called by the Romans Arabia Felix. Unfortunately, the South was desirable property. The conversion of the Ethiopian ruler, the Nagus, to Christianity had brought his country into alliance with Byzantium, and it was with the Byzantine approval that the Ethiopians crossed the narrow straits early in the 6th century and took possession of this fertile territory, proving, as it had been proved so often before and since, that to be fortunate is not always good fortune. <laughs> Uh, before their ruin at the hands of a ruthless conqueror, however, the southerners had opened up the deserts of central Arabia to trade, introducing a measure of organization into the life of the Bedouin who served as guides for their caravans and establishing trading posts in the oasis. Thus, more than 1,000 years of developed civilization came to an end. The very settlements were abandoned as the people drifted off either into a primitive nomadic existence or trekked into the mountains to carve small fields out of the slopes. The glory that was Ma'in, Katahan, Ausan, and Radramaut, <clears throat> and above all Saba, Himyar, faded in the collective memory. The incense route was forgotten. Even the Himyardic inscriptions had become meaningless within a hundred years. The incense tree became a rarity due to, neglect it, uh, due to neglect of organized cultivation. This, the irrigation schemes fell into disuse, and the fields returned to desert sand. The early Muslims had, close at hand, a striking example of the disillusion of civilization. Of the sim if the symbol of these sedentary people was the frankincense tree, then of the arid zone was the date palm. On the one hand, the luxury of perfume, on the other, necessary food. No one could have regarded the Hijaz, where no bird sings and no grass grows, according to a southern poet, as desirable property. <clears throat> there was nothing in that region to attract the predators. The subordination of man to man and of one people to another has been common and formative, uh, formative human experience throughout the ages, but the tribes of the Hijaz had never experienced either conquest or oppression. They had, all, they had never been obliged to say, sir, to any man. In this, they must have been almost unique. The only possible comparisons might be with the Mongols of the Siberian steppes, steppes and the Indians of North America before, coming, uh, before the coming of the white man. Poverty was their protection, but it is doubtful whether they felt poor. To feel poor, one must envy the rich, and they envied no one. Their wealth was in their freedom, in their honor, in their noble ancestry, and in their comparable langu incomparable language, the pliant instrument of the only art they knew, the art of poetry. 
All that we would now call culture was concentrated in this one medium, which required no heavy baggage, such as would have encumbered them on their journeying. Language was something they could shape and model to glorify courage and freedom, to praise the friend and mock the enemy, to extol the bravery of the men of the tribe and the beauty of its women in poems chanted at the fireside or in the vastness of the desert under the vast bowl of the sky, bearing witness to the grandeur of this little human creature forever, forever traveling across the barren spaces of the earth. For the Bedouin, the word was as powerful as the sword. When hostile tribes met for a trial in battle, it was usual for each side to put up its finest poet to praise the courage and nobility of his own people and heap contempt upon his ignoble foe. It is said <clears throat> that there were occasions when a poet's tongue was so eloquent and his words so compelling that the opposing tribe would slink away defeated before a blow was even struck. Perhaps we may detect a vestige of this even today when some Arab leader makes a violent speech full of blood and thunder and return, returns home convinced that he has won, won an ear and destroyed his enemies. He is genuinely puzzled when these same enemies refuse to lie down and play dead. Had he not cut them to pieces with his tongue? Such battles in which combat between rival champions was a major feature uh, were more sport than warfare, as we now understand that term. Affairs of tumult, boasting, and display with few, with few casualties. They served a clear economic purpose through the distribution of booty. And for the victor to press his advantage too far would have been contrary to the concept of honor. When one side or the other acknowledged defeat, the dead on both sides were counted and the victors would pay blood money uh, in effect reparations to the vanquished so that the relative, tri relative strength of the tribe was maintained in a healthy balance. The contrast between this and the practices of civilized warfare is striking. Whether in conflict, in the desert, in the desert wandering, whether in conflict or in desert wandering, survival depended upon qualities of courage and endurance, loyalty to the tribe, and a cult of excellence, which carried with it the obligations to protect the weak in particular, women, the bearers and nurturers of life, and children, in whose frail existence the future of the tribe was enshrined. The hero of pre-Islamic Arabia, uh, of, of pre-Islamic Arab poetry, was always the Bedouin knight, standing upright, true to himself, in a world reduced, as it were, to, bear, to the bare bones of sun, sky, sand, rock. Oh. Proud even in, in poverty and seeking joy in self-mastery, scornful of security and all the ambiguities of wealth, and ready to look death in the face without flinching. Among such people, one finds neither the dregs of humanity nor the scum, which is one way of saying that the principles by which they lived and died were those which the Western tradition associates with arist aristocracy in the truest sense of the term. These are not the principles which govern the lives of townsfolk, and by the 6th century of the Christian era, the Arabs of the Hijaz had discovered the pleasures and temptations of city life. The ancient Kaaba had long been the center of this little world, with the tents of the nomads pinched around it. But late in the previous century, a certain Kusay, a chieftain of the powerful tribe of Quraysh, had established a permanent settlement. This was the city of Mecca, or Baca, a word derived from a Sabian term meaning sanctuary. The circumstances of the circumstances uh, of the time favored its development as a major commercial center. The wars between Persia and Byzantium had closed the more north, uh, northerly trading routes between east and west, while the influence and prosperity of southern Arabia had been destroyed by the Ethiopians. Moreover, the city's prestige was enhanced by its role as a center of pilgrimage, and was that of Quraysh as custodians of the Kaaba, enjoying the best of both worlds. The combination of nobility, were they not descended from Abraham through Ishmael, with wealth and spiritual authority, gave them grounds for believing that their splendor, compared with that of any other people on earth, was as the splendor of the sun compared with the glitter of the stars. The trade routes fanned out through from the city. Wealthy merchants <clears throat> dispatched their private caravans throughout the year, but there was also two great annual caravans to Yemen in the summer and to Syria in the winter, in which the entire population was involved. A sophisticated system of credit enabled even the poorest citizens to subscribe, and, a va and vast armies of two or three thousand camels carrying gold, silver, leather, and precious goods, and supported by up to three hundred men, brought profit to all concerned. 
The city was never still. The camel trains passed through the narrow streets in file, their bells tinkling amidst a crowd, which included Christians, Jews, and Africans, wizards, conjurers, and prostitutes, while the great merchants walked in finery dressed in silk, with amber in their hair and perfumed beards. The busy money changers cried their rates for per- uh, cried their rates for Persian and Byzantine currency. The Bedouin, so often cheated uh, uh, when they came to sell their poor wares, said that the name Koresh was derived from a word meaning shark. Every spiritual center is a symbol of the heart, the center of a man's being. But Mecca was so was so in more than one dimension, since the trade routes were like veins and arteries supplying sustenance to the outlying lands and bearing wealth, which ultimately clogs the heart. Corruption had set in on two levels. In the first place, the Kaaba was no longer the temple of the one God. The Arabs, like mothers, like others before and since, had followed the downward slope, which leads from monotheism to idolatry. They had not lost all awareness of Allah, but thought of him as a supreme deity too remote and too impersonal to concern them in their daily lives. Practical help was to be expected from lesser gods and from unseen, the unseen spirits. The jinn and some 360 idols surrounded the Kaaba in a forest of false deities, catering for every taste among the pilgrims who came uh, each year to worship whomsoever they chose and who brought them further profit uh, for Quraysh. The heart was cluttered with debris. That's an interesting point um, to take a little bit of an aside when it talks about the degradation from monotheism into polytheism. There's a great quote. Um, from a book that was talking about ancient monotheism and how monotheism is actually more of the natural state of humans than polytheism was. And he had said something like that in the book. There was a quote about how men, um, how a singular all-powerful god isn't as like trinkety uh, as these lesser gods. And so sometimes there's like a... Um, there's like an allure to these to denigrate God into these lesser forms because like, you know, all these little little witchcraft and wizardry trinkets and, and little talismans and stuff like that are more enticing to the human soul, uh, to the humans, to the to the negative aspect of the humans um, for, you know, for gain and stuff like that than an all powerful, all seeing God. I'll have to pull the quote up and see if I can post it. It was pretty cool. So it, it attests perfectly to what he was saying, and I don't think it was written around the same time or anything. At the same time, the Spartan virtues of the desert Arabs found no place in so wealthy a city. The connection between idolatry and worldliness is obvious, and the oligarchy of tribal elders, successful merchants, and the outstanding orators, the power of the word was still respected, which controlled the affairs of Mecca, Regulating trade and uh, adjudicating in disputes uh, had developed a taste for the good life which their forefathers would have considered despicable. Drunkenness and gambling were rife, and the Meccans speculated on rates of exchange, the price of commodities and the arrival or loss of caravans, and the spoils of war. Honor had degenerated into false pride, and the obligation to protect the weak, although still observed within the great families, was not applied to the foreigners who had flocked into the city and who had no place in what was still essentially a tribal social structure. Such a city was necessarily vulnerable, a tempting prize. Uh, in the year 570 of the Christian era, uh, Abraha, the Ethiopian viceroy of Yemen, mounted a great expedition against Mecca. He had built a splendid cathedral in Sana'a and Quraysh, seeing in this a rival center of pilgrimage to the Kaaba, had sent one of the, their people to pollute it. Abraha needed no further excuse. Vowing to raise the Kaaba to the ground, he set out with a large army placing in the forefront an elephant, a beast never before seen in those parts, and there was no serious opposition to his advance. He was within striking distance of Mecca, and Quraysh had already evacuated the city, when the elephant halted, refusing to go further. Some say the Arab guide who accompanied the army, having by now learned the words of command to which the beast was accustomed, had whispered in its ear, whatever the reason, the elephant made its decision and the army stopped in its tracks. At this point, there occurred a miracle which is recorded in the Quran, although its exact nature remains obscure. Hast thou not seen how thy Lord dealt with the owners of the elephant? Did he not bring their plans to naught and send against them swarms of flying creatures? Abraha turned back, his army in disarray, and the Kaaba remained inviolate, as it had been from the beginning of time. It was in this year, known as the year of the elephant, that Muhammad was born probably so far as can be established, on 20th of August. His father, Abdullah, was a great-great-grandson of Qusay, 
the founder of the city, and belonged to the Hashemite branch of Quraysh. And his mother, Amina, was descended from Qusay's brother, Zerah. Returning with a caravan from Syria to Palestine, Abdullah stopped to visit relatives in Yathrib, an oasis to the north of Mecca, fell ill, and died several months before his son's birth. It was customary to spend the sons of Quraysh to send the sons of Quraysh into the desert to be suckled by a wet nurse and spend their early childhood with a Bedouin tribe. Apart from considerations of health, this represented a return to their roots, an opportunity to experience the freedom of the nomad and to learn in a formative period of their lives what it meant to be a lord of space, moving, from, moving with the flocks and experiencing the impact of the changing seasons. Thus the bond with the desert was renewed in each generation and the alliances formed in this way between Bedouin and townsmen were useful to both. A fatherless boy, however, was an unattractive investment. Muhammad was accepted by Halima, the wife of a shepherd of the Banu Said, only because she was among the poorest of those who came that year to seek sucklings and could, no, and could find no other. He spent four or five years with this Bedouin family, tending the sheep as soon as he was old enough to walk, learning the ways of the desert and, according to the traditional stories, bringing great good fortune to his foster parents. When he was six, not, all, uh, not long after he had rejoined his mother, she took him on a visit to Yathrib, where his father had died, and herself fell ill with one of the fevers prevalent in the oasis, dying on the return journey. The Arabs' fondness for children and the nature of the extended family assured the security of an orphan, and Muhammad now came under the guardianship of his grandfather, Abdul Mutalib, chief of the Hashemite clan. The old man, he was in his 80th year, although he had many children of his own, including a son, Hamza, who was the same age as Muhammad, had developed a particular affection for his little grandson and made a point of keeping the boy with him when, as was his custom, he rested in the evenings on a carpet set down uh, for him in the shadow of the Kaaba. Here the two of them <clears throat> could watch the world go by, one too old to participate and the other too young, while the great men of the Quraysh strolled past it, uh, st strolled past in the cool of evening discussing the affairs of the city. When the boy was eight years old, Abdul Mutalib died, and he became the ward of a new Hashemite chieftain, his uncle Abu Talib, who, as soon as he was old enough, took him on the caravan journey to Syria so that he could learn the trade. In the in the formative years of childhood and adolescence, uh, in the formative years of childhood and adolescence, he had experienced double bereavement, the joys and rigors of desert life, intimate association with the sacred sanctuary of the Kaaba, traveled in the civilized world, and according to legend, a fateful meeting with a Christian monk who had recognized him in one of God's chosen, and who had recognized in him one of God's chosen, excuse me. He had grown up in the midst of life's ambiguity. Death had struck down those he loved most, yet he had been surrounded with affection and kindness. Impressed upon his heart was an intense awareness both of human fragility and of the only thing that makes this fragility bearable, human affection. When he was 20, he was invited to take charge of the goods of a merchant who, who was himself unable to travel. And success in this enterprise led to further similar commissions. The penniless orphan was making a reputation for himself. Among the substantial fortunes of Mecca was that of the twice-widowed Khadija, impressed by what she heard of Muhammad, who was now commonly known as Al-Amin, the trustworthy. <clears throat> she employed him to take her merchandise to Syria. Even more impressed by his, by his competence, when his task was completed, as also by his appearance and personal charm, she sent a woman friend to ask him how it was that he had not married. He explained that he did not yet have the means. Supposing, asked, su supposing, asked the go-between, that you were offered the hand of a noble lady who combines beauty with wealth? He asked, who sh uh, he asked who she had in mind, and she answered that it was his employer Khadija. How could such a match be mine? Leave that to me, she told him. For my part, he said, I am willing. At this time, Muhammad was 25 and Khadija 40, though still a remarkably handsome woman. It was inevitable that her family should disapprove of such an alliance, but her father was prevailed upon to give his consent, while Abu Talib, with a generosity he could ill afford, paid a bride price of 20 camels, and at the betrothal party made a speech extolling his nephew's virtues, which was a marvel of Arab eloquence. Khadija presented her husband with a young slave, Zaid, who was freed by Muhammad, but when his relatives came to ransom him, he chose to remain with the family. 
The household was further increased by the adoption of Ali, one of Abu Talib's sons, and Khadija bore Muhammad six children, including at least one boy, al Qasim, who died before his second birthday, a pattern of personalities which could only become clear many years later uh, was forming, a pattern which the finger of purpose, the finger of history, probes with an uncertain and anxious touch. In the year 605, the governing council of Quraysh, the Mala, decided that the Kaaba should be rebuilt, although this temple of Abraham is, in essence, timeless. Its earthly form, being perishable, has been reconstructed a number of times, and that year a Byzantine ship had been wrecked on the coast, providing excellent timber for the purpose, and there was a Christian carpenter living in Mecca who was competent to re erect the scaffolding. The main work of construction was divided between the clans, and when it was done, disagreement arose as to who should have the honor of replacing the sacred black stone in its niche. It was decided that the first man to enter the square by a particular gate should be asked to act as arbitrator, and the first comer was Muhammad. He told the people to bring a large cloak, place the stone on it, and called upon representatives of each of the clans to join together in raising it into position. He himself then fixed the stone in its niche. He was by now a man of substance, respected in the community, admired both for his generosity and his good sense. His, uh, his future seemed assured in due course, uh, having reestablished the prosperity of his clan, he would become one of the more influential leaders of the city and in his, and in his life, perhaps, as his grandfather had done, reclining in the shade of the Kaaba a, and recollecting long years well spent in terms of the world's accounting. Yet his spirit was uneasy and became increasingly so as he approached middle age. A need for solitude possessed him and drove him out of the busy city into the rocky hills and wastelands which surrounded Mecca. There he was seized by certain premonitions and visions, sometimes frightening and sometimes like the coming of dawn. Little is known concerning the exact nature of these experiences, but the accounts that have come down to, to us suggest that a great force, a light, a splendor, was approaching ever closer, and like a bird beating its wings against a window pane, trying to reach him through the membrane which isolates us in our little world of experience. Such an approach must have its repercussions in nature, which trembles before the power of unseen dimensions. We are told that the world of stones and rocks and barren valleys seemed to Muhammad to have come to life. Here had strange voices calling, and he covered himself in his cloak, fearing death or madness in the embrace of some dark power. It seemed as though the demons which, uh, which cluster in such desert places and buzz about the traveler's ears pursued him even to the cave in which he took refuge on Mount Hira. His family and friends observed the change in him with increasing anxiety, but there was nothing he could explain to them. There was no way in which he could have understood that his deepest nature was being, as it were, forged anew. Its receptivity laid bare during these solitary vigils, full of terror and expectation. In the blaze of day and during the clear desert nights, when the stars sharp, the stars seemed sharp enough to penetrate uh, the retina of the eye, his very substance was becoming saturated with the signs of the heavens, so that he might serve as, as an, entirety, an entirely adequate instrument for the revelation already inherent in these signs. <clears throat> it would come when he had been made entirely ready. It came on a night late in the sacred month of Ramadan, the night known as us as the night of power. It is said that on that night, nature falls asleep. The streams cease to flow. The winds are still and the evil spirits forget to watch over the wonders of the earth. In the night of Al-Qadr, one can hear the grass grow and the trees speak. The sands of the desert lie in deep slumber. Those who experience the nights of Al-Qadr became saints or sages, for in this night man, man may see through the fingers of God. Since no one can be sure what, which night this is, the believer is invited to prepare himself to open the gates of awareness, sharpen his gaze, and tune his hearing to receive what comes when it comes. Muhammad was asleep in the cave on Mount Hira. He was awakened by the angel of revelation, the same who had come to marry the mother of Jesus, Gabriel called by the Arabs Jibril, who was clothed in light and who seized him in a close embrace. A single word of command burst on upon him. Ikra, recite. He said, I am not a reciter, but the command was repeated. What am I to recite? He asked. He was, <clears throat> he was grasped 
with the overwhelming force and thrown down, and now the first recit recitation of the Quran came upon him. Recite in the name of thy Lord who created, created man from a clot. Recite, for thy Lord is most bountiful, who teacheth by the pen, teacheth man that, he, that which he knew not. The significance of the pen has been richly elaborated in the traditions. It is said that the first of all things to be created was the, was the preserved tablet, which was entered all that is to be throughout time. When then Allah created from a single jewel a mighty pen, the point of which is split and from which light flows as ink flows from the pens of this world, then a command came to the pen, write, whereupon the pen trembled and shook from terror at this summoning, so that there was a quivering in, in its tas tasbih, <clears throat> like the rumbling of thunder. Then it entered over the tablet all that Allah bade it to enter of all that is to be till the end of resurrection, till the day of resurrection. The phallic symbolism of the pen is well known, but this is merely one aspect of its role as the supreme instrument of creation. The implied connection between knowledge and creation as such is particularly significant in the Islamic context. One second, guys. I gotta grab something to drink, man. My freaking... I am, uh... Getting... I was getting super dry. Be right back. The story of this first revelation has been told as often as any story in the world. 
Yet to gain some personal inkling of what it was like, we were obliged to make an imaginative leap through the screen, which keeps us locked into our habitual everyday experience. There is no simple way of provoking this act of release, since each individual is different, his nature unlockable only by our particular key. Those who have come face to face, face to face with the most powerful amongst the manifestations of the natural world, great storms at sea, hurricanes, volcanic eruptions, may find in their experience a clue to that which is meant by an encounter with a power from another dimension of being. But the people of our time find it difficult to imagine the shattering of the habitual personality which takes place in the presence of the Mysterium Tremendum, <laughs> in the presence of the Sublime. No doubt, eh. no doubt the appropriate word is awe, yet this word has become so devalued in the English language that it will no longer serve unless we can cleanse it from the trivial associations. Even in our time, however, one occasional one occasionally meets a pious man who has been uh, accorded the rare privilege of entering the prophet's tomb in Medina, and who has been so transformed by wonder and by awe that the experience can only be described in terms of terror in the full and majestic sense of this term. If the human substance is so shaken in the place where this man's body was buried long ago, we may judge from this what his own experience when the angel approached him. At the same time, since past events are seen in the light of their consequences, we have, to, we have to bear in mind that this encounter of an Arab 14 centuries ago was a being from beyond the screen, was an event of momentous significance, which would, have, which would move whole peoples across the earth and affect the lives of hundreds of millions of men and women, building great cities and great civilizations, provoking the clash of mighty armies and raising from the dust much beauty and much splendor. It would also bring teeming multitudes to the gates of paradise and beyond to the beatific vision. The word Ikra, I, or Ikra, <clears throat> echoing around the valleys of the Hijaz, broke the mold in which, uh, in which the known world was fixed. And this man alone amongst the rocks took upon his shoulders and into his heart a burden which would be crushed, which would have crushed the mountains had it descended upon them. Muhammad was 40 years old and he had grown to maturity in the world. The impact of this tremendous encounter may be said to have melted his sub to melt to have melted his substance. The person he uh, had been the person he had been was like a skin scorched by light and burned away, and the man who had came down from the mountain and sought refuge between Khadija's breasts was not the same man who had climbed it. For the moment, however, he was like a man pursued. He as he descended the slope, he heard a great voice crying, Muhammad, thou art the messenger of Allah, and I am Jibreel. He looked upward, and the angel filled the horizon. Whichever way he turned his head, the figure was still there, inescapably present. He hastened home and called to Khadija, cover me, cover me. She laid him down, placing a cloak over him. As soon as he recovered himself a little, he told her what had happened. She, she held him against her body, giving him, as it were, the earthly contact which saves a man's sanity after such an encounter. She, re she reassured him that the hu with the human reassurance and believed in the truth of his vision. When she had settled him and he had fallen into a deep sleep, uh, she, went at, uh, she went at once to see her cousin Waraka, one, one of the Hunafa. These are isolated individuals who rejected idolatry, seeking knowledge of the one God, either in the tradition of Abraham or through Christianity. After listening to her account of the husband's experience, Walraka told her, By him in whose, ha whose hand is the soul of Walraka, if what you say is true, there has come to Muhammad the great Namus, even, even he who came to Moses. Truly, Muhammad is the prophet of his people. Calm your husband's fears and banish your own. Some further revelations came to Muhammad. It is not known precisely which or how many, and then the, the heavens were silent for some weeks, perhaps for many months. Darkness descended upon the, his spirit. However terrifying the great vision might have been, the angel's absence was even more disturbing, for he was now left alone with his human weakness. It was as though a crack had opened in the carapace which encloses this world, so that he had seen and heard things which make the ordinary life of mankind appear unbearable, unbearably narrow and suffocating. Now it had... Hey! What did you find? Did you find a bead? Oh, it's gone now. Hey! Good morning. Good morning. 
Good money. Sorry, baby just woke up. Baby just woke up from her nap. Hey. Just woke up from your nap. You want some more? Okay. Let me get her some stuff, guys. I don't know, I can't see that, but aren't. Now it had been closed. Having been taken out of this world and made a stranger to his own people, he found himself abandoned in a kind of no man's land between heaven and earth. He had asked Khadija, who will believe me? And she had answered, I believe you. But this was love speaking. How could he expect others to believe him, leave, believe when he himself was in doubt as of the nature of this vision? The fear of insanity, which had been with him for some time, now became acute. He had seen such people often enough, lunatics raving about the unseen, aliens in the community, and objects of scorn to the sensible, hard-headed townsmen. He himself had always been a, pr a practical man, a man of business, and he belonged to a race which tends to take a down-to-earth view of things and to regard spiritual extravagance with suspicion. A dreamer would not survive for long in the desert, walking alone in the hills, hoping for some relief. He came to a steep precipice, and his foot dislodged a stone, which tumbled into the abyss. He was seized by an impulse to follow it. I wanted, he said long afterwards, to find lasting repose and to rid my soul of its pain. It is said that he was about to throw himself over the cliff when the angel's voice intervened and said, Muhammad, you are the true prophet of Allah. He returned home, 
And soon after this, a fresh revelation came to him, the surah called uh, Ad-Duha, the morning hours. By the morning hours and by the night, when it is most still, thy Lord hath not forsaken thee, nor doth he hate thee. Truly that which is to come shall be better for thee than that which came before. And truly thy Lord shall give unto thee, and thou shalt be well pleased. Did he not find three, thee an orphan and shelter thee? Did he not find thee wandering and direct thee? Did he not find thee needy and enrich thee? Therefore press not the orphan, neither repulse the beggar, but declare the goodness of thy Lord. From this time on, the revelations continued for the rest of his life, memorized and written down by his companions on pieces of sheepskin or whatever else was at hand. Sometimes, he said, they come, they come to me like the rever reverberations of a bell, and that is the hardest upon me. The reverberations abate when I am aware of their message. And sometimes the angel takes the form of a man and speaks to me, and I understand what he says. Khadija had been the first to believe. The question as to who was the second is a matter of dispute between Sunnis and the Shia sector of Islam. The former say that it was the merchant Abu Bakr, Muhammad's close friend, a quiet, sensitive man of humble origin, who who was much respected as a consolator, a concili conciliator. Many years later, the Prophet said of Hamel, I have never called anyone to Islam who was not at first filled with doubt, questions, and contradictions, with the exception of Abu Bakr. The Shia believed that it was Ali who would have been about 10 years old at the time, and certainly the other member of the household, Zaid, Zaid <clears throat> followed soon after. It is unlikely that there were more than 20 converts in the first two or three years, and when Muhammad invited all the senior members of his clan to a great dinner and preached the message to them, the occasion ended in disaster. One of his uncles, Abu Lahab, was openly abusive and became the most implacable enemy of the new religion. <laughs> The situation changed when the command came to him to preach openly and to speak out against idolatry. At first, the elders of Quraysh had been able to ignore this strange little group, treating Muhammad as a sad case of self-deception, but now they began to realize that his preaching, which was attracting adherents among the poor and dispossessed, and could therefore be seen as subversive, represented a threat both to the religion and the prosperity of Mecca. Open conflict, however, would have been against their interests. Their power depended upon their unity, and with the example of Yathrib torn asunder by the, funk, by the factional conflict as a grim warning of that which could happen in their own city. They were obliged to bide their time. Moreover, the clan Hashem, whatever it might think privately of its rogue member, was bound by custom to defend him, and he was attacked. They confined themselves for the time being to mo for the time being to mockery, perhaps the most effective weapon in the common man's defense against the inbreak of truth, since it does not involve the degree of commitment inherent to violence. His former guardian Abu Talib begged him to go slowly and not to rock the boat. Oh, my uncle, he said. Even if they are set against me, the sun on my right and the moon on my left, I will not abandon my purpose until Allah grants me success, or until I die. Abu Talib answered with a sigh, Oh, my brother's son, I will not forsake you. Tension in the city increased gradually, month by month, as Muhammad's spiritual influence spread, determining, undermining the hegemony of the elders of Quraysh and bringing division into their families. It was this influence, and this influence became even more dangerous to the established order when the content of the success, successive revelations was broadened to include denunciation of the callousness of the Meccan plutocracy, their greed for more and more and their avarice. The opposition was now led by a certain Abu Jal, together with Abu Lahab and the, and the latter's brother-in-law, a younger man who was more subtle and more talented than either of them, Abu Saf Safyan. Returning one day from the hut, the hunt, Muhammad's boyhood friend, Hamza, uh, who had so far remained neutral, was so angered on being told of the insults heaped upon his friend that he sought out Abu Jal, stuck him on, struck him on the head with his bow, and announced there and then his conversion to Islam. More important still was the conversion of one of the most formidable young men in the city, Umar uh, ibn al-Khattab. 
Infuriated by the increasing success of the new religion, so contrary to all that he had been brought up to believe, he swore to kill Muhammad regardless of the consequences. He was told that before doing, uh, before doing so, he should look into the affairs of his own family, for his sister and husband had become Muslims. Bursting into their home, and he found them reading the surah called Taha, and when his sister acknowledged that they, they were indeed converts, he struck her a harsh blow. More than a little ashamed of himself, he then asked to see what they had been reading. She handeth him the text, and he and he readeth uh, the verse. And as he read these verses from the Quran, his nature underwent a transformation so sudden and so total. This incident has sometimes been compared to the conversion of Paul on the road to Damascus. He went directly to Muhammad and accepted Islam. Men such as these were too important in the social hierarchy to be attacked, but most of the new Muslims were either poor or in slavery. The poor were beaten and the slaves tortured to make them deny their faith, and there was little Muhammad could do to protect them. A black slave named Bilal was pegged down naked under the devouring sun with a heavy stone on his breast and left to die of thirst. In his torment, he cried out repeatedly, Ahad, Ahad, one, one, God is one. <clears throat> and it was in this state on the point of death that Abu Bakr found him and ransomed him for an exorbitant fee. He was nursed back to health in Muhammad's home and became one of the closest and best loved of the companions. When, much later, the question arose as to how the faithful should be summoned to prayer, Umar suggested that the human voice as the best of all instruments, and Bilal became the first uh, muezzin of Islam, a tall, thin black man with a magnificent voice, and so, so it is said, the face of a crow under the thatch of gray hair, a man from whom the sun had burned out during his torment, everything but love of the one and of the messengers of the one. The persecution became so severe <clears throat> that Muhammad advised the more defenseless of the new Muslims to immigrate, at least temporarily, to Ethiopia, where they would be well received by the Christian Nagus, an upright king. About 80 converts fled there in AD 614, and with them the future caliph, Uthman ibn Affan. He had long been in love with Muhammad's daughter, Rukia, Rukia who had uh, been previously married to her cousin, one of Abu Lahab's sons. The choleric father of the flame, or father of flame, as he was called on account of his red face, had compelled his son to divorce her. And as soon as she was free, Uthman had entered Islam and married her. This apparent alliance with a foreign power further infuriated the Meccans, and they sent envoys to the Nagus, demanding that the Muslims' extradition. A great debate was held at court, and the Muslims won the day, first by demonstrating that they worshipped the same God as the Christians, and when they reciting... And, and then by reciting one of the Quranic passages concerning the Virgin Mary, whereupon the Negus wept and said, Truly, this has come from the same source as that which Jesus brought. Frustrated on every side, the Meccan, on every side, the Meccan oligarchy, oligarchy under the leadership of Abu Jal um, now drew up a formal document declaring a ban or boycott against the clan Hashem as a whole. There were to be no commercial dealings with them until they outlawed Muhammad, and no one was to marry a woman of Hashem or give his or give his daughter uh, to a man of the clan. The ban lasted two years, but, like sanctions in later times, proved ineffectual. The structure of Quraysh was too well uh, integrated, particularly by intermarriage between the clans, for such an act of inclusion to be workable. In any case, it was bad for trade. The proclamation of the ban, so it is said, was eaten by insects, leaving, by, leaving only the words, In thy name, O Allah, as a sign for those who were prepared to understand it. The year 620 of the Christian era, however, is known in history as the year of mourning. Now over 80 years old, Abu Talib died. Henceforth, Muhammad can no longer rely with any certainty upon the protection of his clan. His enemies now encircled him, warily but, growing in, but with growing determination, convinced that if they could destroy uh, him no more, he would, uh, no more would be heard of the religion of Islam. Then Khadija died. The two pillars upon his personal and emotional security had rested were gone, and the world was a colder place than it had been before. 
if ever there was a time for a miracle, a divine intervention to supplement the Quranic revelations, this was it. Towards the end of that year, the miracle came. The, re the, rev <clears throat> the relevant verses of the Quran are, to say the least, succinct. First, glor glory glorified be he who, ca who carried his slave by night from the sacred mosque to the far distant to the far distant mosque, whose precincts we have blessed in order that we might show him some of our signs. He is the hearer, the seer. Secondly, when there veiled the lote tree, that which veils the eye wavered not, nor did it transgress. Truly he beheld of all the signs of his Lord the greatest. These verses refer to two successive events, the Isra, the night journey, and the mirage, the ascension. They have been illuminated by the authentic sayings of the prophet, elaborated by tradition and embroidered in legend. The religious imagination has gone to work on the available material and given birth to a vast literature <clears throat> so that it is often difficult to locate the dividing line between fact and fantasy. Perhaps this does not really matter because the creator of all facts is also the creator of those products of the inspired imagination which reveal the underlying significance of the factual. Gabriel, the angelic messenger, came to Muhammad when he was sleeping in a room close to the Kaaba and touched him with his foot. The sleeper awoke, but seeing nothing, lay down again. A second time he came, a third time, and then he took him by the arm and rose, and I rose and stood beside him. And he led me out to the gate of the mosque, and there was a white beast between a mule and an ass in, in appearance, with the wings at his sides, wherewith he moved his legs, and his every stride was as far as the eye could see." He mounted this strange beast, whose name was Barak, meaning <clears throat> lightning, and was carried at a speed beyond all conceivable speeds across the mountains and the deserts, halting briefly, briefly at Mount Sinai, where Moses had received the tablets of the law, and at the birthplace of Jesus in Bethlehem, before alighting in Jerusalem, the city already sacred to the, other two, monothe to the two other monotheistic faiths, and thenceforth sacred also to Islam. The threads which might seem so widely separated were knit together and in jerusalem muhammad led a host of prophets with abraham Mo moses and jesus at their head in prayer to the one god here where the temple of solomon had once stood and where the dome of the rock would one day be built a great ladder was placed before him the like of which for beauty i had never seen before this, it is said, is the ladder which uh, dead yearned to see brought forth, for it leads to all that man humankind could ever desire, and onwards, beyond desire, to the realms of light upon light. Guided by the angel, he mounted through the heavenly spheres, meeting again those prophets with whom he had prayed in Jerusalem. Uh, there they had, the, they had appeared to him in their human forms, but now he saw them in their celestial reality, transfigured even as they now saw him. Of the gardens which adorn each heavenly sphere, he has he was to say later, a fragment of paradise the size of a bow is better than than all beneath the sun. And if a woman of the people of paradise appeared unto the people of earth, she would fill the space between the heavens and here below with light and with fragrance. In each heaven he met the angel of angels presiding over it, each of them commanding a host of thousands, each of whom has under his command many thousands more. Accounts of the mirage uh, and commentaries upon it are filled with images of astonishing richness and, profu richness and profusion. An aspect is piled upon aspect, and numbers are multiplied by ever greater factors. Images that dazzle and confuse, because if we are not sometimes dazzled and confused, we may think that we have grasped in an earthly manner that, that what can never be grasped in this way. The same technique whereby it is partially possible to describe the indescribable and, and to imagine the unimaginable was employed by the early Christian fathers in the writings of the cherubim and the seraphim and other ranks of the angelic hosts. <clears throat> Here, for example, is Gabriel, seen through Muslim eyes. He, is, he, was, uh, he has 6,000 wings, and between each pair is a distance of a journey of, fi of 500 years, and he has uh, plumage which goes from his head to his feet and which is the color of saffron, and each plume looks like the light of the sun. He plunges each day 640, 660 times into the ocean of light. When he comes forth, drops of light fall from him, and Allah creates from these drops angels in the image of, Jibra, in, in the image of Jibreel, who glorify Allah until the day of resurrection. 
But even such a creature as this, in all his splendor, is still a slave of God, hardly more than a speck of dust in the radiance of the divine majesty. And having guided Muhammad to the low tree of the uttermost boundary, he could go no further. This is the limit of creation, both natural and supernatural, human and angelic. And here, Gabriel spread his wings, saying, O Muhammad, approach as close as you may and prostrate yourself. Alone, exalted above time and space, and even above the angelic spheres, Muhammad went forward and bowed down before the throne of God. With the eye of his heart, he contemplated his Lord, and the voice of his spirit held converse with him, while in the depths beneath the angel, ho the, the angel host cried out, We bear witness that the Most High is one and living, and there is no other God but he, and we bear witness that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger. When, in his earthly identity, he was asked, Did you see your Lord? He replied, I saw light. Here we leave behind us <clears throat> every possibility of comment or explanation, and it may be for this very reason that the record now turns to practical matters. Muhammad was commanded that he and his community should pray 50 times each day. This number was reduced first to 40, and then to 30, and finally to 5. This erasing of the burden was accompanied by the promise that whoever recites these five prayers daily, uh, believing sincerely in their efficacy, will receive the reward due for 50. The connection between these instructions and the vision of God is not far to seek. In, in relation to such a vision, it must surely be axiomatic that a constant state of prayer is the only reasonable condition in which a man or woman can exist. Reasonable, that is to say, in terms of reality, uh, now known uh, at first hand. In recognition, however, of human weakness and of the fact that we, s we seldom, if ever, use our spiritual faculties, or even our mental faculties, to their full potential. Five daily prayers are as much as can be expected of us. Not that it, this diminishes the absurdity of the life lived between these prayer, these prayer sessions, unless we retain, in the midst of the worldly activity, an awareness of the connection established in prayer and something of, of its flavor. Returning uh, from the Supreme Station, Muhammad was again met by Gabriel, who showed him the boundless vistas of paradise and the suffocating corridors of hell, delight and misery, beauty and ugliness, harmony and, and uproar, the open and the closed. What was said earlier regarding the utter inc incommensurability <clears throat> between human language uh, on the one hand and celestial or infernal realities on the other applies with particular force here. But since all things are linked, a link must exist and must be discoverable in our human experience, provided we are able to extend our awareness beyond the local causes of such exper experience and seek its existence or its essence. Real joy, the joy of paradise, may to some uh, may to some extent be tasted through the images of earthly joy, and the ultimate pain may be glimpsed through the pain we suffer here. Muhammad said once, "Paradise is closer to you than the thong of your sandal." And the same applies to hell. It might even be said that this follows logically from the Quranic statement that God is closer to man than his jugular vein. The whole mystery of human existence turns upon the fact that God and all that lies beyond our sphere is so very close to man, while man at, la at least <clears throat> in, the, in his reality every day, in his, at least in his everyday experience is, is so very far from God and far from other dimensions of reality. Imagery such as that employed in traditional accounts of the prophet's vision of heaven and hell, however exaggerated and even fantastic it may sometimes appear, is there to serve as a bridge over this gulf. But it can do only can do so only if it is used as a key to intuit uh, to intuitive understanding rather than taken literally. Hmm. There you have it. That's why the Divine Comedy, a lot of the people read it and seemed to acknowledge it to their conversion to Islam. Dante's indebtedness to these Islam Islamic sources for the imagery of the Divine Comedy. Huh. <clears throat> there is, however, one question which has been hotly debated in the Islamic world from that day to this. <clears throat> did the Prophet travel and ascend only in spirit, or did he do so bodily? What both sides in the argument seem to forget is that the world we experience through our senses is not a lump of inert matter, isolated from other dimensions. They forget that what we see here is, as it were, bathed in the unseen, penetrated by it in every atom. The body comes, the body goes, changing as the clouds change form. 
finally to be resurrected, transmuted, and the Muslim knows that what God has created, he can, if he will, recreate, here, there, or anywhere, now, or at any time in the future. Did the prophet ascend bodily or spiritually? He ascended. Was his experience subjective or objective? It was real, which is all that matters. His companions certainly raised the question when the traveler returned of time and space and met with them in the earthly day, for they were practical men concerned with practical matters. Only a few intimates were told the full story, but even so, the idea that he could have traveled in the twinkling of an eye from Mecca to Jerusalem and back again was hard for some accept, for, was hard for some to accept. It is one thing to know in principle that God, who made the laws of nature, can override them if he wishes to do so, quite another to accept that this actually happened. Some of the doubters consulted Abu Bakr. Did the messenger of God actually, himself tell you this? He, he, he asked them. Yes, they said. Then it is true. From that day on, Abu Bakr was known as uh, as Siddiq, the truthful or the witness to truth. Not for the first time or the last, the people were being tested. They held firm. Very soon they would immigrate with the prophet to the city in which Islam was to become a world religion. They were the nucleus, and it was upon their fate that everything depended. Chap oh, and then that's it. That's all of chapter five. Made it through pretty quick today. How long was that? An hour? Dang. Well, that concludes today's readings. <clears throat> we will move on next time to chapter six the city of the prophet i appreciate everyone being here i wish everybody a blessed ramadan and a blessed uh rest of lent leading us unto easter so everyone be well god bless everybody take it easy